Um, hello, everybody. Welcome to our special March 20th, 2013 meeting of the New York Linux Users Group. Um, today, we'll be hearing from Stefano Zac. Uh, excuse me, I've already messed this up. Uh, Stefano uh, Zaccaroli. Uh, Stefano is also known as Zac for the reason. <laughs> the uh, Debian project, and uh, we're fortunate to be hosting him today. His talk uh, today will be an overview of Debian, uh, 20 years and counting. Uh, Zach is uh, also an associate professor of computer science at the University of Paris Diderot. He has been involved in the Debian project since 2001, taking care of many tasks from packet maintenance to distribution wide quality assurance, and he has been leading the Debian project since April 2010. So tonight, before we get started, we just have two quick requests. The first is, please silence your cell phones. Uh, and the second is a new one. We don't have coffee machines here, so just please be careful if you are around either of the tripods there. They are uh, broadcasting and recording, so just try not to uh, jostle them at all. Um, we'd like to thank Google for graciously allowing us to use this great space. Um, we'd also like to thank our other sponsors, IBM, Canonical, Brandor Group, and O'Reilly Media for their continued support. Uh, in addition, Nylog would not be able to function without our many volunteers who have contributed greatly over the years. After the meeting, we encourage folks to join us for more talk and drinks at McKenna's Pub. That is at 250 West 14th Street. That is just east of uh, 8th Avenue on the south, uh, southeast side. Um, we do have a reservation in the back of the bar. They will be keeping the volume low in the back, so it's going to be a good environment to talk and you don't have to take down the address. We'll be going there in groups afterwards. Um, I do want to mention there will be trivia questions. There weren't last week, but we will have trivia questions. They'll be back. Uh, this will be a little unusual. Zach has um, delegated the questions to other people, so he doesn't know what they are. Um, so pay attention. They will be relating to his talk. We have uh, four books from Addison, Wesley, and Prentice Hall, and three ebook vouchers from O'Reilly and Associates. Um, so, on to the announcements. This weekend, March 23rd and 24th in Cambridge, Massachusetts, the Free Software Foundation's annual conference, which is called Libre Planet, will be happening. It's a conference by free software activists, for free software activists, and those that are curious about the whole thing. And our next workshop will be on March 26th. James will be continuing his series on terminal workflows. So please find Rob, Menez, David Bristow, or James Meldrum if you have any questions about the workshops. Does anyone help? Let me actually start. Brian, you have uh, an announcement? Uh, there you are. Hi, guys. I'm sure many of you are aware that there's a, a bill uh, under consideration in Congress right now called CISPA, or the Cyber Intelligence Sharing and Protection Act. Uh, I think it's a, a dangerous bill. Uh, it has the potential to um, change our expectations of privacy and what access the government has to our private information. Um, I, I'm not going to go into great detail about it, but you can check out information about it on cispaisback.org. You can Google for it. Um, you know, but I, I encourage you to look into it, and if you disagree with what's happening, to take action uh, somehow. Uh, perhaps reach out to your elected officials. <coughs> And um, any other thing, I will be at the bar afterwards if you want to discuss it further. Uh, does anyone else have any announcements? Uh, Jay, you're usually good for one. Any? I, I, I have none, but, but there's something called palladium. No, no, I'm sorry, secure boot. You already know about it, so no announcement. All right, no announcements from Jay. Um, if that's the last one, then uh, please welcome our speaker, uh, Zach, otherwise uh, known as uh, Stefano Zaccaroli. So thanks, thanks, everyone, for inviting me here. It's a real pleasure, in particular because so one thing which was missing in the, in the small bio that I sent to Tom and Ryan was that uh, I will be uh, we go on retirement from DPI one month from now, and it's kind of a nice coincidence that my one of my last talk at DPI is here when I started doing an interesting talk at the DPI conference 2010. So it's a very nice coincidence. So thanks. Uh, this talk will be a general review of Debian with uh, what I think makes us somewhat special with respect to other distributions, and also with an overview of how we could all help with what we're doing. But before that. Uh, just want to go, maybe, maybe not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I 
this laptop since I bought it two years ago. <laughs> Is it the screen or demo? Nice demo aspect. <laughs> Do we have any elevator music? <laughs> <laughs> so first time it happens to me in a talk about Debian in like 10 years. Interesting. How old is the laptop? Three years. Okay. But before I only had lap uh, uh, Lenovo laptops and like a thing, but so maybe Sorry. the first trivia question could be how many years since it's had <laughs> <laughs> during the presentation about that. I'm on it. Is anyone timing how long the boot takes? <laughs> Peter, you want to write an announcement that I just thought of? Oh, sure. We have an announcement. Save us. That's why I did all this. <laughs> Okay, I can't remember the exact date. Surely someone here remembers. When in April is the Free Culture New York conference? April 23rd? 23rd and 24th. Say again? Yeah, yeah, it's April. It's late April. The 20th and 21st. Ah, the 20th and 21st. Cool. Uh, also, as long as you're still booting, right? Yeah. Um, so uh, the, Wikimedia, uh, the Wikimedia sites now let you script templates in Lua, Ooh. which is cool. And uh, I work at the Wikimedia Foundation, and we're trying to improve site performance. Say again? Oh, sorry. I'm Sumana Harihadeshwara. As long as I've gone on for more than 30 seconds, I guess I need to say my name. Um, and uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and if you look at our blog at blog.wikimedia.org, you can see more about how, if you've ever been interested in playing around with Lua, here's a chance to play around with it and then actually embed it in a real wiki page that millions of people will see and hopefully help improve our render time performance because it should not be the case that the page for Barack Obama takes like 30 seconds to parse and render just because of all the nested templates in it. So well, the opposing nested um, templates. They actually did some special, somebody did some special <laughs> optimizations just to make the Barack Obama page go faster because it was so embarrassing. But generally, if there's a lot of nested templates that are built in incredibly old, hacky, inefficient wiki text, like, it really sucks for performance. So yeah, if you wanna, if you ever wanted to play around with Lua and help make it even faster, it's just great. Oh, wow, it's more serious? Yep. All right. Let me give it one more try. I have a PDF on my USB stick. All right. Do you want us to? Well, I have a laptop here. It's not on the blog. It's not on the. It's Suminama. Sumana. Sumana. Sorry, I don't see it on the blog. I'll try the next page. Yeah. Yeah. So I just give you a USB stick. It doesn't anymore. It's not nice. Ooh. It means they will have a background yeah. thought yeah. for the rest of my talk. But, you know. <laughs> 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 Use the PDF to set up files from and put it the only one. And, 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 and this one? Uh, I just need a laptop. Okay, so I'm not sure if this shows anything. Just double click on it and see what happens. No, I have to. If it freezes your laptop, we'll know why. That's <laughs> fine. As far as that laptop traveled in the last few weeks. No, I don't have XPDF. I don't have ACPRO. Uh oh. No, it doesn't have ACPRO. Yes. Update. It is, yeah. Make it for the region. This is already more interesting than most of the songs. I'm sorry. It works beautifully. I get full 3D.
here it is. Yeah. Here it comes. That's it. That's it. Okay. <laughs> here we go. Thanks. We weren't, we weren't prepared for this, so back to that. Oh, wait. Of course, we did test everything in advance, but not the final crash of my laptop. <laughs> <laughs> so, sorry. Um, I was saying, before entering the detail of Debian, I just wanted to mention the reason why I know this. And you probably heard. Oh, that's a different problem. <laughs> oh, come on. Apt get install sonic screwdriver. Be able to fix this. Fifth page. Yes, fifth page. Twim. 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 This is great. Apparently, it's more interesting than this. No, this is great, actually. What size is X? It's a clone. That's it, okay. some are uh, ideological. So the reason why I mean all this and it's to guarantee that the people using software have the same right that they get when they were, than when they were using some mechanical stuff. Okay? And this is a very nice quote from makers that probably most of you have read. And essentially the key notion here is that you are free you are an em empowered to use your own stuff really be in control of your stuff only if you can control whatever you could do. With. So the point is that if we can use a screwdriver, script a screwdriver, sorry, as we want, we should be able to do the same with every single piece of software that power our lives. Uh, and because if you are unable to do that, well, as Lester put in this quote, well, you are just missing. So for me, the notion of free software and the main reason why I mean all this is to have the control over the device that power my life. And given that electronic devices are more and more part of your life, well, you will be more and more in control of your life of not depending on all this. Okay? So this is my main notion of, of free software, why I'm doing all this. And the main question which Debian adds to solve is how you deliver this control that we should have on our physical device to people. Okay? And there are various ways to do that. So an historical ways to do that so how we were doing free software like 20 years ago was the one you see on this slide. So it was very simple. You just had to download a tarball and already figure out what a tarball is. You had to unpack it. You had to do something magic called uh, uh, configure. <laughs> figure out what does it mean to add like a missing bar bug, whatever. And then iterate and do make, make install as a magic recipe. So this is the state of using free software like 20 years ago. Okay. And then nowadays you have tens of thousands of pieces of software that change every day. Okay. In Debian we have something like uh, 
3,000 3, new versions of software per month. Okay? And imagine having to do this dance every time a single piece of software changes. Okay? So the idea that distribution tries to solve is this one. Instead of doing this, a distribution acts as an intermediary between people who do the software, the, what we call the upstream author usually, and people who use the software, the user themselves. My and, God! Sorry. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Better. So distribution are intermediaries between people that do the software and people that hold to use that software. Okay? And the key idea is that you have a set of packages. Okay, you probably know that these days because all these sort of uh, app stores were exactly with the same notions. Okay? And people that do distribution essentially put together a huge set of packages you can choose from and guarantees that you can uh, use them together without any uh, sort of hassle and make them uh, coherent one with another and offers you the right abstraction to install or move with a very So this, this is what every single distribution out there does. And this is what they can do as well. So what we're gonna do in this talk is first giving you a brief uh, overview of Degen and Wheezy, uh, then tell you what I think is kind of special in Degen. Talk about uh, a little bit about the huge ecosystem of derivatives of Debian that exist out there and conclude in explaining how you can contribute to what they're doing. So Debian is one of the oldest distribution around. This year we will turn 20. So 16 of August, mark the day, will be the 20th birthday of Debian. Uh, and if you look back, and thanks to Usenet and thanks to some good archives that are around here, there, you can still find the original mes message with which Ian Mardo, in t about 20 years ago, created that. And it's pretty insightful on what was the reason back then to create that. So back then there was the idea to be competitive with commercial operating <coughs> systems. So it took us 20 years. We are somewhat competitive in some area, not in all of them. Uh, but it's, it's finally going to happen. And he wanted back then to make that easy to install. And back then, the notion to be easy to install had nothing to do with the notion to be easy to install that we have today. Okay? Back then, it was more like, let's avoid some configure, make and make install, and not just plug a USB stick in your computer, and 10 minutes after have a working Gnolium uh, system in your machine. Okay? But the real evolutionary idea behind that, yeah, it was to make a distribution <coughs> built in a collaborative way. Back then, we already had collaborative free software products. Okay? So people were collaborating in writing the software itself. But the distribution, so the people who, who did the assembly of software together, making it useful and easy to use for users, was made by a single individual. And the main intuition by Ian back then was that if you want to scale, if you want to be able to collect in an easy to use assembly all sorts of free software that was out there, well, you needed to make it collaborative in a team. So the, one of the main innovation that Debian did was to put the collaboration model also in distributions. And finally, it was the idea to be really open in how things were done. So there was already, of course, the GNU project back then, and that was an inspiration for Ian to do something as open and in the spirit of GNU as possible. And this was something that, didn't, that wasn't yet uh, available at the time. Okay? So this is 20 years ago. Today, Debian is various things. I usually try to describe it using three different Access. Okay. So the first one is the, the product that we offer. Uh, so we offer an operating system. The main product that we offer is what we call Debian Stable, okay, which is a system meant to be to last in time. So it's something you put on servers or on desktop that are meant to, to last for a long time. Um, that product on average is released every two years. So I know there has been a lot of you know, interesting discussion about how long does it take for Debian to release, but if you look back over the past like 10 years, it's on average every two years with a very, very low variance. Uh, it's kind of proud for us that it's completely free. So what we offer you is have a guarantee that by default, you have all the usual freedoms of free software applied to all the software you can find in Debian. Okay? Uh, it's uh, available on a huge set of architectures, about a dozen, a dozen for our latest, latest release. Uh, and it offers some archive-wide support for about three <coughs> to three point five years, depending on the duration of the release cycle, on all the packages of the archive. So when you when you are talking about, when you're thinking about long-term support for Debian or for other distributions, a huge difference in Debian is that we offer the same kind of security support for all the packages in the archive, not only a small subset of a few hundred packages. 
uh, it's in this this specific product is very is well known for a whole sort of features like the fact it's pretty stable, the fact that it will work on all hardware, good documentation, and all in all is one of the largest free software porting platform we have out there. So if you are an upstream author of some software, you want to know if your software will work on some device from really small devices to big super server. Usually getting your software into Debian will help you with that. Because we try to build it for dozen different architectures, <coughs> even on multiple kernels nowadays. Okay? So this is what we offer as a product. Uh, and just to give you an overview, so the current release ver the current, the current released version of Debian has been released in February 2011, so about two years ago. A lot of things happened, so I won't go through that because it uses kind of uh, oldish today. But we did a couple of interesting things in the last release. We added support for a new kernel. So Debian nowadays doesn't work only with the Linux kernel, but also with the uh, kernel der derived from um, 3DSD, which we call K3DSD. And you have a whole set of uh, packages. Not all packages are available on K3DSD, but quite a bit and enough to have for instance, a file system using a DFS or a desktop environment running on top of a K3 DSD kernel. And also, we completely removed the non free blobs from the kernel we distribute by default. So if you take a Debian squeeze image, what we'll find is something that is completely free of non free blobs. So you, by default, you only get some completely free kernel and all the software which is released. And also, we have uh, developed a set of blends. So what we call tool blends are Debian customizations that we do ourselves for specific uh, field of applications like uh, education or science or uh, geography information system. So you do find specific customization of Debian for this kind of uh, context. And what's interesting for me is that all this is being very, very successful. So if you look at the stats today from uh, uh, institution like w 3 Tax, you will find out that Debian is the most popular uh, OS, uh, the most popular free operating system, sorry, for, for the web. So about one third of all the web servers out there running no Linux actually run Debian. And overall, according to W3Tex, about one web server out of 10 runs Debian, which is pretty impressive. Uh, I put this in relation with stable because usually uh, stable is what you, would, you know, what you want to run on your web servers, but the statistics actual, uh, actually don't tell you which version of Debian is being run. So this is the, the past, sort of, and the present, the future of Debian is the release which we call Wheezy, which is going to happen really soon now. Uh, <laughs> I'll get to that in a moment. And what have we changed in, in about two years of development? So we have made a rather uh, profound change in how we deal with architectures with the introduction of something we call multi arc which is essentially a sane way of mixing on the same system different um, binaries built for different architectures. So this is the same way to do, for instance, cross compilation, and also same way to mix on the same machine binaries built for 32 bits and binary built for 64 bits. Okay, so this is a kind of redesign which is not entirely visible to users, but will help you running third-party application and also do uh, cross compilation. And also we have worked quite a bit on cloud support, so we believe that it's paramount. It's of paramount importance that users are able to run their own clouds because it's the only way to control the infrastructure of your computing platform. So we have added support to create your own private cloud using stuff like OpenStack, XenXCP, and OpenEbola, which has been around also in, in Swiss. And we are also adding support for uh, some popular public cloud platforms, because we do have users that want to use Debian on, on uh, some public clouds. So even if the clouds in themselves are not entirely free, we don't control, we believe they are better off using Debian than something else. So we have other support right now. We have images for EC2 and for Azure, and some more might by, 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 by be coming in the future. And of course, you find all sorts of updates in the release of Debian. So essentially, about three quarters of packages have been updated during, during this release cycle. And we have also added two new architectures. So you will find ARMHF, which is an ARM version in which we have support for our float, uh, floating point of operations, and support for S390X, which is a architecture for a huge virtualization servers. Uh, so when do we release this? So as we speak, we have something like 100 pending bugs we need to fix, a third of which have already a fix which needs to be deployed one way or another. So my own uh, estimate is this, in one month from now, we will have released 
it's an estimate, so don't blame me, don't shut the messenger, but that's my estimate. Uh, you can help today. So if you want to, if you're a Radio Debian user using maybe Squeeze, you can help us by upgrading to Wizzy and reporting if you find any bugs. Or even if you're not yet using uh, Squeeze or, you've, or if you don't want to upgrade yet, just try a fresh install and you find, if you find something that's not working, just let us know. That would help us quite a bit. Uh, so that was one part, the product we make, Debian's, the Debian stable operating system. And then there is a project. So Debian is also a group of people which are up to a common task, which is developing the, the best possible entirely free operating system that we can put together. And this um, actually objective is what brings a lot of people together with this specific goal. And they are helped by a couple of um, document that essentially uh, cr have created the ethos of the Debian community. So one of these documents is the Debian Social Contact, which is an agreement not only between Debian developers, so not only between uh, a member of the Debian project, but also between them and the free software ecosystem as a whole. So in this document, we guarantee that everything you will find in Debian will be, always be entirely free. Uh, we guarantee to give back. So essentially, we do not want that the change we make to free software that exists is only for us and for our users. But we try also to give it back to the legitimate upstream offer and to the community as well. We are engaged to do all this transparently. So we have no profit reason to do what we are doing. So we have no reason to hide, for instance, technical problems in our distribution. And we try to set what are our priorities, which are on the same line, both the, the users, our users, and free software engineers. So this is kind of a moral statement which binds us and the free software community as a whole. And then there is a second document which is used to define the project, which is Debian Constitution. And this is for me is quite fascinating because this day is pretty common to, to talk about e-democracy. But back then, when this document has been written, it was not so common. So people doing Debian back then, it wasn't around, but at this very interesting intuition of saying, okay, we are kind of a, a nation. We have a notion of citizenship. We have a notion of who are the members of the Debian project, and we need some sort of ground rules to decide how we decide, okay, and to decide what are the structures. So in the Debian constitution, uh, you will find essentially some sort of structures and rules of something which is like a, a free software compatible democracy. So we do have a democracy, we do vote, for instance, to elect the, the project leader or to take a, a very important political decision for the project. But we try to make that compatible with the, the, the usual practices of free software where you just want to, if you're able to, to scratch a niche, you need to be able to do that without having to go, go through some kind of voting or some kind of heavily bureaucratic process. So these two things together and the role of uh, the goal of Debian project has been a very strong motivation for people to, to join the Debian project. So if this map, which I don't know how well you can see, there is distribution of all the Debian developers that decided to share their location information. So you will see that uh, we have a lot of developers in Europe, we have a lot of developers in North America, and we are growing in South America, we have something in Australia, in Japan, and we are much less present in, uh, in, in Asia. So this is somewhat very close to distribution of free software activism in general. So Debian is probably a good sample of where you have participation in free software, and we are kind of representative for that. And if you're interested, I, I had a look at some statistics, and uh, you might want to take a guess at the US position in all this. Okay, we'll keep that for a question later. Uh, so unsurprisingly, the US are the number, the, the, the country with the highest number of Debian project member in the world. There is something like uh, 330 uh, Debian developers which are registered in the US. And uh, not all of them are active, but that makes something like one third of the Debian developers in the world are from the US. Uh, and the active ones are about half of that. So like uh, 150 active Debian developers are in the US. You are doing much worse in terms of number of Debian developers per capita. So if you normalize the uh, population, you will get it position 25, so you still have some home of improvements in, <laughs> in large parts of the country. Please go and tell them, start participating in what they will do. And then the, the, the last part of the Debian project, as all free software projects, is the community. 
So we have a kind of peculiar community which is based on the our ground rules. So it's a community where we are grounded in transparency and where it's pretty easy to have an impact. Easy if you have the needed skills, which is kind of a weird notion, but the point is that there is a notion of empowerment which is pretty strong in that. So pretty often if you know how to do something and you propose a patch, you have, an, you have the possibility to drive the direction of project <coughs> in a direction or another. Because there is no like uh, structure to, to take decision in very formal ways, so as soon as you have the needed skills to do something, you are usually empowered to do and change what you want to change the project. Uh, we have a large amount of communication, even if you're a bit old style, so we have a lot of mailing communication and IRC communication. We use a bit some uh, social network, but there aren't that many social networks which are compatible with our free software principle out there. So you will find our official presence only on some on the social service like uh, Identica, because you can find uh, an official uh, Debian account and a uh, Debian group. And the last trait of our community that I'd like to mention is that we have a very large number of tech savvy users. So it's very common in Debian that when we, we get a bug report, we will find a patch attached. And this kind of denotes that we are more appealing to the uh, more technical oriented people, especially in, in terms of software developer than uh, to other kind of users. So these are the three things, and they get together in really complex processes. I will not go into the details of all this, but there are some rules and processes of software evolution in Debian. Some of them are pretty common. So we have a development archive where we put uh, the latest version of packages. And we have a sort of staging area where software get qualified to after some uh, delay time and after some automatic verification like no serious bug has been reported from the last 10 days before entering the next archive. And in this staging archive of packages is what we call the, the testing suite. Okay? And periodically when we want to make a release, we freeze all this, which is happening right now. Okay? And when we have get, gotten rid of all the uh, what we call the release critical bugs affecting this, test, this testing area, then we release the stable project. Okay. Uh, th there is an interesting side effect of all this, that this suite, the testing suite, is a nice mixture of pretty fresh software, which has been already automatically verified and tested by other users for the absence of some critical issue. So if you're looking for uh, what's today called a rolling release, which is a nice mixture of this kind of stuff, well, Debian testing might be what you're, what you're looking for. I think it's a pretty good uh, match for people uh, that are interested in having a, a recent desktop, so with some kind of fresh software, or maybe developers that need some kind of very recent library stack, but which has been tested by someone else before getting their development box. So this is not a product um, like a stable, so we consider our main product only Debian stable, but it's a good match if you want something in between, between a development release and uh, something more stable. Is that slide available somewhere? So the slides will all be available. They are already available in my uh, GitHub repository, but they will give the PDF to the organizers, so I guess they will make it. Yep. Uh, that's uh, um, uh, from Martin Kraft's book. Uh, yes, so this one, the credits are in the, in the sources. This one, I think, this specific slide, I think, is also on the Wikipedia page of the, of, uh, that has been made by Martin Kraft for his book of a uh, few years ago. Okay, so this was for general review, but the, there are a couple of interesting questions now. Uh, no. No, no, no. Uh, no worries. So the Debian is not the only distribution out there. You might have heard about some other distributions. Uh, if you look at the distributional review sites, you will find hundreds and hundreds of different distributions. So DistroWatch collects something like 300 of them. Okay. So it's, it's important to know why choosing Debian and not something else. So why, what is the the main characteristic of Debian. So what uh, what does we do differently than other? Okay. Uh, so I have an answer of mine, which is based on uh, uh, on four points. Okay. And I don't claim that on any individual point of them we are doing much better than others. I do claim that if we look at all of them together, you'll find something which is pretty unique in the context of horizontal distributions. And I think it's a good reason to to choose either to use Debian or even better to use and contribute. So the, the first point is a sort of 
a cultural trait that we have, a sort, a sort of obsession with quality in the sense of some sort of perfection. Okay? This is not something we can measure, me measure actually, but it's something you feel in the community. So there is really a, 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 a interest in doing the right thing, even if it takes longer to, to get to the result. So you find this decline in various ways. So you find it in the technical manual that is used to, uh, to specify how a package should look like, which is the Degen policy manual. And there you will find a culture of standardization. So many of the early people in Debian were coming from a background of uh, um, protocol standardization and document standardization. So your, this manual reflects something on this. And essentially it tells you how a package should look like. How should it behave in all sorts of weird conditions when you install or remove upgrade and all sorts of kind of fitting you can do with that. And uh, you can find this notion of quality decline also in the, uh, the testing activity we do. So we have all sorts of stress testing, testing for packages to check they are actually respect policy. You will find this notion of quality in the fact that usually package maintainers in that end are software experts of the software they're packaging. So it's generally considered bad in Debian to maintain a package you are not uh, able to, to patch, for instance. So it's pretty rare, or at least it's not very well seen by others in Debian, to be a maintainer of a package knowing only about packaging and knowing quite a little about the internals of a specific piece of software. And that means that when you report a bug against something in Debian, you will end up having a, a peer with which you can talk to that knows something about the specific software and potentially is able to fix it himself before forwarding the patch ups to This is pretty cool. And finally, you find that also in the fact that we try to treat all the packages at the same level. So we try not to have different uh, partition of our archive in which some packages are more supported than others, and some packages are better than others. Of course, they might have more or less bug than others, but in terms of requirement, we, we keep all the packages at the same level of requirements as all other packages. <coughs> And also the fact we take a while to release, well, it should be interpreted in that sense. So the, the, the Debian motto we release when it's ready or some old Debian t-shirt that good things come to those who wait or all these kind of jokes we have in the Debian community uh, are essentially about this notion that we rather not trade off some fixed release date for uh, lowering uh, release quality or quality. So this is the first thing that for me makes Debian pretty interesting and quite unique, package quality. The second one is the, our attachment to freedom. Um, so the, the, the main principles that are behind that are in the social contract, okay, and binds together, and they bind together user and Debian developers about software freedom. So the first guarantee that it's offered by social contract is Debian will remain always entirely free. And this essentially means that Debian has been promoting free software culture for the past 20 years. Uh, and essentially, when you when you want benchmarks to uh, to see if something is free, for instance, people essentially look at three entities, three main entities: the FSF, OSI, and they usually look at OSI. So we've do, we've been doing this, and we're considered an important political actor of uh, free software in general. And you see this also in the fact that we are entirely free, the bottom up, not only in the software we distribute. So all the software you find in the Debian main archive is entirely free but also in the infrastructure we use. So no one in Debian would accept offering to our users some non-free service like a backtracking system to report back against Debian, for instance. No one would accept in Debian to use, for us as developers, some kind of non-free infrastructure to do what we're doing. So all the infrastructure we use to make Debian is free as well as all the software we distribute. And no one would accept doing anything else. So there is some sort of uh, heavy dog fooding in, in all this. Uh, our communities seem to know that uh, and seem to appreciate Debian for this specific reason. Uh, and essentially, we're kind of considered to be uh, trusted entities for not betraying this principle of, of software freedom in what we do. And all in all, I think this has been a very important role for free software in general. So, beside the technical contribution that we have made, beside the, the product we release, I think this has set a very high bar for free software advo advocates over the years. So we are used as a benchmark to understand if something is free or not, and that's pretty important. Third point, which is more and more important every passing day, is independence. So it's kind of hard to define, so let me try to explain what I mean with this. 
there is no single company behind it. We have companies contributing um, some work to Debian, contributing, donating to our events, and we are grateful for them. But you cannot pinpoint Debian to a specific company. This is kind of very rare. If you look at the uh, most popular distribution out there, I can name a distribution and you will be able to name the company which is behind it. Also in other uh, community distribution, you will find that whether they are or not spin-off of commercial distribution which exists. In Debian, this is not the case. So we, we, are, we cannot be tied to the interest of a single country. So everything which happens in Debian, in terms of the resource we use, in terms of the work we, are, we put in Debian, is essentially either donation from people, from individual and from company, or a sort of gift economy where people exchange work because they have an interest in something, a mutual interest in something, and they work together. And so this is kind of pretty uncommon in uh, all other uh, mainstream distribution of that. And this is a result on our community as well, and I think it is that people trust that the decision we make are not actually driven by specific profit for profit interest of company that might be behind them. They sort of trust that we do decisions which we think are right according to our principle and not driven by specific monetary interest. And then the last point is how we make decisions. Uh, and that too is kind of peculiar in that end. So the, ground, the main role we, we try to use is something that we're all, we sometimes call duocracy. So it's a kind of a democracy of the people that do stuff. Okay. So it's something you will find directly in our constitution, which essentially empower every single person which is in charge for some task to work on that and do as they please, as long as they're doing the work and as long as they are up to the standards of quality that we've set up. Okay? It means that there is no bad in Debian that can be uh, can go to someone, tell that person, you should do this that way, unless they are willing to put their job, their work, and, and do that themselves. So this is kind of related to the sense of empowerment that, we're meant, that was mentioned before. But it also, but in addition to that, even if we try not to use too much, we also have some democratic correction of all this. So we can get together, all developers, and decide at majority with a democratic vote on every single matter which is of interest for the Debian project. We can decide on technical matters, on political matters, we can overrule any single body which exists in Debian, we can overrule the DPI, we can overrule every single decision which is made in the project by getting through that. This is not used much, especially for technical reasons, but it's a possibility and it's something that guarantees that you have some sort of uh, balance in the power of the project. And the, consequence, the consequences of all this is that the, the reputation you have in Debian essentially follows work. So if someone is well known in Debian, it's usually because he has done a good job for a long time, and this is where his reputation comes. Um, it also means that there is no benevolent dictator, no oligarchy in Debian. Okay? So even the role of DPL is mainly a coordination role. Everything else is very uh, commonly driven by essentially in a bottom-up way. Uh, and it finally means, again, that there are no imposed decisions. So if there is no someone who is, can impose their decision because they, they've hired people, because they own the infrastructure, or because they, they have the money to make the decisions. So all these four things together to me make Debian a kind of an interesting distribution which is kind of unique out there. Uh, and then, and this is something which has happened more recently, Debian has developed a kind of interesting ecosystem. So there is a whole sort of derivative distribution out there which depends on Debian, benefit from our, from our work, and actually give back to us some of this. So just a small interlude, so what I mean when I say that derivative. So you are probably well familiar with the free software freedom, and the idea of a derivative is that you apply the last two freedom of software, the freedom to redistribute copies of something, and the freedom to improve a program and there's the redistribute improvements. And you apply those two freedoms, not to a single software as you usually do, but to a distribution as a whole. So you take a distribution, like that, yeah? uh, you take all existing packages, you add some other packages which are not available in your base distribution. Okay? You add patches where you need them, you rebuild all the packages for your own targets, for your own architectures, and periodically you try to sync. If you do all this, you obtain what I call a derivative distribution. It's a hell of a work. It looks simple on paper, but 
even only having the infrastructure to do that and keep up with the rate of change of Debian is, is a hell of a problem. Okay? So if you do that, you obtain a, 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 what I call a, a derivative distribution. And it's pretty interesting that Debian um, and the derivatives model that's been so heavily based on Debian this last year have essentially changed the way in which distributions are made. It's pretty interesting for derivatives because they can focus on customization. Okay. They do not need to do all the groundwork which has already been done in your base distribution. Okay. You just need to focus on the customization. You need people power only for that, in addition to uh, set up all the infrastructure you need to, to keep this. And if we do this properly, well, everybody wins. Okay. Because the derivative distribution can benefit from all of the work which has been done in the base distribution. But the base distribution, possibly thanks to this customization, can reach out to a new public. And that new public could be new users, but could also be new contributors. So if you are aware of how all this is working, well, that's a win-win win situation for both the base distribution and for the data. Uh, Debian is very popular as a basis for this for data. So if you look at the, again, at the usual uh, distribution review sites, you will find that something like 140 uh, distribution out there declared to be based either directly or transitively on that. So almost a half of all distribution are there, descend in some way from that. That's pretty impressive. And the reason why I think it's the case is, that is, is rooted in how we do things. So we, we do quite a bit of quality and licensing assurance in our software. Okay? So if you base your work on Debian, you, you know that, for instance, someone has already thoroughly reviewed your packages and you know that they are free. Okay? They benefit from the quality work we do. We are quite well known for the fact that our base system, so the core packages that get installed when, when you install a, a fresh Debian, is pretty solid. And we have a huge package base. So if you base your work on Debian, you will have, well, about 30,000 packages which are already available. Okay? And also we have a kind of a motto that we are the universal operating system, and with that we mean that we are not targeted at any specific field of view. Okay, we are more popular maybe in the server context, but it's not like we, uh, we do choices specifically for, the, for that field of view. So if you want to customize your derivatives, well, it's better to start in from something which has not been already customized for something else, or a goal different than yours, and try to customize for your product. Okay. And there is a minor example that you might have heard of, um, a distribution called Ubuntu, uh, which you surely know of. So it's been started at almost 10 years ago now. Uh, initially, the target was the desktop, but then it's been expanded to other targets. And it started a sort of a design goal as a Debian derivative. Okay. Uh, it's very popular, so it's kind of hard to judge popularity of things. And, uh, uh, but if you look, so this sample here, if you look at the popularity contest pages, which are this kind of uh, submission system where users can decide to inform their distribution that they have installed specific packages. So if you look there, uh, Ubuntu is something like 20 times the, uh, the submission that we have embedded. Okay. So it's, uh, it's very popular, they claim some very high quote, a very high percentage of new computers sold in 2012 with uh, Ubuntu per install. And, uh, and it's something different in Debian in various ways. So for instance, they have a, uh, an archive which is split in a main and universe part. Okay? Historically, on the main part, you tend to find more people developing than it that are uh, canonical employees, while in the universe part, you have more community work. Okay. <coughs> It's uh, heavily customized with respect to Debian in main. So it's not so close to Debian in the main part, but it's very close to Debian elsewhere. So all the universe part of Ubuntu is very close to Debian. <coughs> um, and if you look at some statistics, so these are for uh, the, currently, uh, the current development release of Ubuntu, which is varying wing time. So if you look at that, we will find that about 10% uh, of the stuff you have in Ubuntu is not available in Debian, so it's new stuff, which is only packaged in Ubuntu, and most of it is like upstream software which is being developed by Canonical itself. You will find that about 12% is Debian packages which have been patched, so it's, they started from Debian package, they added some patch and obtained the Ubuntu package, and what remains, which is about 78%, is 
unmodified Debian packages which have been rebuilt for them. So if you look at Ubuntu, which is incredibly popular, you will find that an astonishing high amount of packages there are unmodified Debian packages rebuilt for the And it's very interesting because what has been happening to Debian in terms of derivatives nowadays is starting to happen also to Ubuntu. So they are sprouting their own derivatives and then they have something like 80 derivatives based on Ubuntu, which are transitively based on Debian. Okay. So the ecosystem is pretty common. Uh, so my main point here, I guess, is that uh, in addition to what we do, in addition to the release of Debian that we do ourselves, there is a lot out there which is directly or indirectly based on Debian. So even if you don't know, even if the distribution we are using is not directly Debian or maybe is not very vocal on the fact that they're based on <coughs> Debian, well, the well-being of Debian is actually the basis for the well-being of a whole lot of a whole lot other distribution out there. Okay? And it's very interesting because it's something which is enabled and made possible only by, by the free software development model. Um, so what is happening here is kind of uh, interesting. It has been happening for the past 10 years. So more than 10 years ago, the distribution model was quite simple. So you had upstream authors, you had single tire distribution, and you had users. So users used to choose their the distribution they please. And there was some interesting flaws there. So new version of software flew from uh, uh, upstream through the distribution to the users, and by very important patches flow the other direction. Okay. And for the past 10 years, actually, things have been more complex. So the ecosystem is becoming more complex. Actually, you have several different tire distributions. So we have upstream motors here. You have a first tire distribution, like for instance, Debian. You have a second tire distribution, like Ubuntu. And you have more tires, like, uh, uh, I don't know, Lubuntu or uh, multimedia customization of Ubuntu. And all these are additional tire between the upstream motors and the final user. So all this is great, because every time you add a tire, you have the possibility to reach out to a new pub. You have a possibility to reach out to new users, okay? And that has been happening to us with Ubuntu, but also of to reaching out to new developers. So for instance, a lot of developers, they've been developers in the past year, have been coming from Ubuntu, and probably they would have never have heard about free software in the, play, in the first place if it, if it weren't for, for Ubuntu. So there are some pretty interesting vi uh, virtual cycles there, okay? Um, but what we care about is that all this is sustainable. So we are proud that Debian is playing an important role in all this, but we need to care about the fact that all this is sustainable for everyone. So the principle we have been trying to, to push out there for the past years is that for us, and we also, we also for others, we are doing all this essentially not because of Debian, but because of free software in general. So we want that free software in general as a development ecosystem is sustainable, and for us, the, the recipe to do that is that every single block in the chain actually take care of upstreaming stuff. So this has been a kind of a mantra in the developing community for, for the past years. So we, we ask some sort of engagement to everyone in this chain to try to push their changes upstream. And we ask that to ourselves. So we try to work with upstream ourselves. If we have some patch in Debian which has not been forwarded to, to upstream, we think it's a problem we need to solve. But we ask the same to our downstreams. So we ask our downstream to try to work with us or directly with upstream to push the changes back and to try to integrate them in, in upstream. And also to give some credit. Because uh, communities thrive on, uh, you know, on, uh, on pride for what they're doing. So especially volunteer communities need to know that their work is, uh, is appreciated. So they try to, to, they need to be proud of the fact they're doing something and they need to be credit for what they do to be able to keep on doing what they do. Um, so yeah, uh, this is another thing which is kind of peculiar in Debian, the, the amount of this derivative distribution out there that depends on our work. So if you're interested in all this, I hope you will also be interested in contributing to what we do. Okay? And there are several ways to do that. Some of them are wrong, and usually the, the reason why people try to contribute to Debian in the beginning are not the right reasons. For instance, we try to explain to people that you should not be interested to contribute in Debian only to have your uh, pet software packed there and then leave it there and, and go away. This is not the right way to approach Debian development. It's not for you, it's not for your software that you're interested in, and it's not a good model. So we have some other suggestion to do that. 
The first one, which is not yet related to, to working with us, is by donations. So even if you are a completely volunteer project, we do use resources. Okay? We have a park of like uh, uh, 120 servers, I think, not considering the mirror network and not considering the big big network. Only the infrastructure to do uh, daily uh, work is something like that. Okay? So we use resources, we use hardware resources to do all this. Uh, we use money for hardware related services like warranties or spare parts or place. And we use quite a lot of our budget for to sponsor development meetings. So even if you are a completely online community, it helps a lot to meet face to face. So we periodically organize uh, face to face meetings. Okay. So you can donate to us to support this kind of stuff. And in particular, one of the biggest meetings we, uh, we have every year is that the annual Debian developer meeting, which happens around the world every year. Okay. This year it will be in Switzerland, in uh, Bobaku. Okay. So if you fancy a uh, overseas trip, that would be a great way to, to get to know the people that do that. Okay. And there too you can help us with sponsorship. So if you have a company that you think is interested in sponsoring our event, there's a link there, you can pass them. And there is another opportunity if you're an individual that would like to donate, so you can donate individually. And there is a very interesting matching fund set up by but by Gupta and his company actually until the end of April. So they will match donation until up to uh, 5K dollars. So that's pretty generous of them. And you can help us making a better conference this year. And so this is one way. Okay. One way is donating us resources. But the other one for people that are interested in contributing their work is to actually help us out with what they're doing. Uh, there are various ways to do that. So the first way, as a, as a mere user, is to report bugs. So that's kind of a, a moral obligation for users in free software, in my opinion, and it's a very useful contribution. So we won't be able to know that a package should not hit the next table release if it weren't for users reporting bugs. So Help with us, help us with that, it's very important. Uh, please help us reporting good bugs, like follow up with your bugs when the developer asks questions. Try to make your bug report usable. Try to test it if the developer sends us some patch and this kind of stuff, that's very important for us. And if you care about specific packages, you can monitor them and follow up to bug reports reported by others. So you can, for instance, go to this package check, this thing which we call the package tracking system, which is our Q&A interface. You look up the package you are interested in, for instance, DPKG, maybe not a good choice for a first package, but <laughs> And you can subscribe, there is a button to subscribe to the package, and you will get notifications of all sorts of interesting changes to the package. New versions, but also bug reports reported by others, and then you can help out with um, commenting on those bugs, okay? So this is the first way, just look up a package you are interested in and follow it. A second way is, when you start to be interested in uh, adopting packages is to uh, adopt one of the orphaned packages. Okay? So instead of starting with adding something new to that, have a look around and see if something which is there is in need of help. One way of doing that is to install the package called TypeScript and run WNPP alert from that package. It will tell you all packages which are installed on your machine which have no antennas. Package which are still in distribution, but with no person which is the responsible person for care, for uh, sorry taking care of that package. And look at it. And if when you want to start and learn about the Debian packaging, we have a very wonderful tutorial to do that. It's a Debian packaging tutorial, which will uh, which will guide you through the benefits. Okay. So second way, have a look around, see a package which is need uh, need for help, and help us with that. Third way. When you want to do more, oh yeah. How does that fit in with what you were saying earlier about uh, people not maintaining packages or they may not know the internals? Because okay, yeah, yeah. Sure. good point. So I'm not saying just pick one package randomly which is not maintained and do that. It, it, it assumes that you have some knowledge about that. So just not pick up one random package. Among the packages that need help, try to match with your abilities and your interest in that. Absolutely, thanks. Uh, third way, which actually goes in the, in the same direction, is to join packaging teams. So the packaging work in Debian is organized in teams. Okay? 
that usually follows some specific <coughs> interest, like Bluetooth, Bluetooth, cloud, some games, uh, science, voice over IP, or sometimes they are uh, organized around programming languages, like people maintaining uh, uh, Python libraries, or Java libraries, or parallel programs, or Ruby, or Kamen, or whatever. Okay? So if you have a specific interest in a specific field for which it exists in a packaging team, or maybe if you have competence in a specific language for, this, for which it exists a packaging team, well, start to look at their activities. So if I use list of <coughs> packaging teams at this URL, okay? look around, see if there is a team that matches your interest and abilities, and start to follow the work there. This is an excellent way to actually learn packages, packaging sorry, from experienced contributors and to actually also get in touch with Debian as a community. It's a great way to go for it. Then, if you are a developer, if you are maybe you are not interested in doing packaging, that's great. We have a lot of development tasks in Debian that need some good developers. You don't need to be able to do packaging to work on that, okay? and it's something which we really appreciate. And there are some interesting opportunities there because the Debian infrastructure is pretty heterogeneous and complex, so there are some good challenges for developers there. And the impact you can have on actually millions of indirect users of Debian is, is very, very important. So how do you start with that? Well, look up some web interfaces of the service we are using. Most of the internal services we use have some sort of web interface. And we try to do a good job of having footers or about page, which pointers to uh, where is the source code of the service, which pointers to who is the person in charge of maintaining that services, and of where is the URL or the backtracking system for that service. Okay? If this information is not there, it's a bug. <laughs> Please let us know. It's not <laughs> mail Debian developer or mail even myself and let us know that we, we forgot what this information we tried to fix. <coughs> So this is for developers, and actually, we also have a whole lot of other tasks which are not related to development, okay, which are not related to packaging, which we badly need to keep up function. Okay. So we are a huge project, we have no company backing us, and that means that we need to do a whole sort of non-technical stuff to just keep the project running. Okay. For instance, translation work. We have an impressive community doing translation, okay. that's something could always use output. Okay. Uh, design, artwork in general, teams for a next release, or design for the websites of our service, or communication. So we have a, a growing community of people doing some sort of, essentially they're doing journalistic work, doing advertisement for Debian, doing press officer jobs for Debian, doing all this kind of writing work. So if you're a technical writer, or have an interest in communication, well, come talk to us. We, have, we need your help. We are doing events. So DevConf uh, event is run yearly. It hosts something like 300, 400 person. Okay. Uh, we do uh, lodgement and food for all of them. We do travel sponsoring for all of them. It's a very huge event, and it's completely organized by volunteers. So even if you are not into development, even if you are not in other kind of uh, non-technical skills, if you are a good e event organizer and you want to volunteer your time, that's great. We have a job for you on that front too. Documentation, uh, video, we have a great video team which takes care of uh, filming all sorts of Debian talks and various events. You can help with that too. Accounting, we, we want to be transparent in our budget. Okay. We have to have a team, internal team of accountants that produce budget reports of what we do. So which are, we are kind of an uh, ecosystem in which everything is done by volunteers. So no matter where, what's your area of interest, are motivated by free software, I'm pretty sure, that, sure there's a job for you that we can offer. Okay. Uh, this, all this too is also indexed at the, uh, this URL, DebianAug.teams. You will find all sorts of things there, not only the, the technical development part, and have a look and see if it's something that uh, fits your interest. Uh, then, when you find the area of Debian you are interested in, there is the option of joining the project. And we have different level of commitments might be interested in. So the, the basic level, if you are into packaging, is to just being the package maintainer. So we'll, you will have the name as maintainer of some package in Debian. You will not have access to the archive, so you will not be able to upload the package yourself. But we need to find some Debian person to upload your work to the archive once it's done. It's a great way to start a mentoring 
a relationship, but you will be a bit limited in your uh, ability to be independent in uh, the work you do for that. Then, if you are still interested in packaging, there is a, a, another step, which we call Degen Maintainer, DM. Okay? And this is a specific technical role in which you will be able to upload your own packages. Essentially, we'll say, okay, I'm interested in maintaining this set of packages, okay? and once we are uh, we have reviewed your skills in doing that. We will give you access and the possibility to upload only these specific packages to the dependent account. Or the next step is becoming a proper member of the Debian project. Okay. And in that role, you essentially become a, a citizen of Debian. You will have voting rights in all the decisions we make. If you are into packaging, you will also get uh, unlimited access to all the packages in the archive. So this is a role for which we require quite a bit of trust because you will, be, you will be able to affect quite a bit of users. Okay? But the role of Debian project member is not limited to technical contribution, it's not limited to uh, packaging stuff. So if you are doing some work for Debian, if you're doing that for a while, if, you, if we trust that we are on the same page with respect to uh, free software, then you are fully entitled to become a member of the Debian project. My tips to start is just pick a team on the page I mentioned, <coughs> Start following what they are doing, hang out in their IRC channels, and everything usually flows naturally from there, depending on your interest and depending on uh, your uh, commitment to the project. So that's basically it for me. If you want to more to know more, well, I understand we are going to share some drinks at the pub, so it will be a nice occasion to chat with me about this. Uh, we have web resources, we have some social media, we have plenty of mailing lists, and we are quite active on IRC. So just hang out with us, and uh, we'll, uh, I'm sure you will find some common interest. So thanks a lot, and if you have any questions, I'm available. Does an inactive member become so inactive that you can declare him not physically dead, but you know, I mean, sort of gone <laughs> for, the, for the project and what do you do with this? Okay, so there we enter in some sort of uh, quality assurance uh, metric for membership in technical communities. That's pretty common stuff. So what we do is that we we monitor some of the activities like uh, commits, like uh, votes, like upload to the archive, and where there are inactive for a while, they will get a ping from the uh, internal team, which is Debian account manager. That, I think, happens after one year or two years of inactivity. <coughs> I'm not sure about the details, but we, we ping them, and essentially either they do not respond, so eventually we will remove their account, or they will respond and say, yes, I'm still around, and just having some bad time. So this is what how we do that. What is the uh, problem between Debian documentation people and the Free Software Foundation in regards to free documentation? <laughs> well, you I mean the, the group free kind of documentation of license? Okay. Okay, it's a, for us, it's not really free enough. So essentially, there is a, actually the, a different principle there. So essentially, the, the Free Software Foundation considers that uh, software and documentation should be held to different freedom standards while for, for all sorts of valid reasons. While we consider all the content, which is in the Debian archive, should be up, held up to the same freedom standards. So for us, whether it is documentation or software or firmware or art, graphic arts, it, it's all the same. So for instance, we do not accept that you can say that a part of a specific document should not be changed. This is something which is allowed by the no free documentation license, which is not acceptable for the Debian free software guidelines. So the root of the disagreement is there. Yeah. So that, uh, so we. Uh, 
been asked to comment on the uh, publication of a diversity statement. So this is something we did like uh, one year ago or something. And essentially, we uh, it's nothing new for other projects, something that didn't exist before in Debian. But essentially, in the last two years, we went through a couple of interesting changes. One is the change that we, has, we, de we decided that all kind of contribution to Debian that are uh, that has been done for quite a while that we can somehow measure to see how good you are doing that are equally valid to become a member of the Debian project. So that was the first change we did a couple of years ago and we have some people which are in Debian for a reason completely unrelated to development or to packaging now. Okay, for instance, some of our press officers are not doing development work but they are doing a great job as a press officer and are a full member of the Debian project. And in addition to that, about Six or one year, six months or one year later, we published that diversity statement, essentially saying that we welcome diversity in Debian. We think it's something which uh, increases the quality of our community, and we encourage all sorts of uh, people to be part of Debian, no matter their preference in any way. Uh, I'm not giving up on the queue, so would you, would you, if you'd like to, I can. Yeah, I think you would. You were. Okay, sounds like you're in charge of the keynote. Okay, um, you mentioned the interest in all sorts of contributions, uh, like you know translations and press work and accounting and so on. It sounds like for package maintenance, there's a really clear mentorship and apprenticeship path. And it, it, you're nodding, so maybe you know what I'm asking, which is tell me about how Debian's working on mentorship and apprenticeship paths for these other really important, especially translation. I think that's what I'm especially interested in, these other really important contribution styles. Okay, so I'm nodding because, so this is a fairly recent change for a project which is a 20 year of history. So we are still uh, starting to kind of ramping up on that front. So we have a very clear mentoring community for packaging work. We are still doing things in a bit of an ad hoc way for everything else. But the fact that we are structuring in thematic teams means that there is some kind of natural mentoring structure in the teams. So if you're, for instance, if you start being interested in Debian and working in the publicity team, we've got some mentoring there for publicity and press stuff, and then that's your, your plan. But you're right, so we don't have yet some clear mentorship structure for the, the non-technical parts, so we only have some implicit mentorship via existing teams. Yeah. So this goes back to the education question again. Uh, just as you're an educator, I just wanted to get from you, uh, is there a more recent uh, book you would recommend? Can you keep the mic closer because I cannot hear? Uh, is there a more recent book that you would recommend which explains the kernel and the how the Debian uh, uh, production OS works? So for, for which kind of target? I mean, to teach the using Debian, to teach... Uh, to, yes, to teach and perhaps even for new... Okay, so science, uh, there, is a, there is a fairly recent book which is called the Debian Sysadmin Manual, Sysadmin Book or something, I can look it up. <coughs> it, it's a book that has been written by a couple of Debian developers which have been making some crowdfunding to actually liberate the book. So the book in itself is free. It's available at the, as a Debian package, and it's also available as a paper book that you can buy uh, online or in various books. I think if you look up uh, in the Debian archive for Debian and book, you will find it. I think it's Debian sysadmin admin book, or maybe someone can look it up and let me know. But it's available in Debian itself, and it's a very good book. Uh, can I ask a philosophical question? Yeah, sure. I, I, I look at the slide, I'm very thank you very much for the, for the talk. Debian as a distribution, not as a Linux distribution. Is Debian Linux or not? Because with the kernel uh, for like FreeBSD okay. and so on, I mean, what is the community process? So we, we used to be very bold on the fact that we are called Debian GNU Linux because we clearly we want to uh, give credit to, to both the OS and the kernel. Now we're using Debian as a short form, and we use the long form for Debian GNU Linux, Debian GNU k 4 BSD, Debian GNU Herd, we have that too, but we cannot make the list, you know, every time we talk about Debian saying all these 12 words. So we use Debian as short form, and then when you want to single out a specific kernel, we usually have this specific form. Okay. 
We have never used Debian Linux alone. We have always said that they know Linux, or and now that they know free and BSD, or etc. I believe that was the Debian administrator's name. Yes. Thanks. Thanks to Brian for putting that up. Uh, any other questions? Oh, we have more. Uh, right here. Hi, my name is Carlos. My question is, is there any way for a user to receive an objective measurement of uh, automated tests that are running as a package, or any kind of way of measuring the quality of package that way? Okay, so uh, we have a website which is Lentian, which is the, the one of the main quality metrics we use on the, on the Debian packages, which is run automatically at every, well, I don't know if it is at every package upload, but it happens periodically, so that you can look it up. I think there are RSS feeds you can subscribe to. And we are setting up, but we are a bit behind other efforts uh, on that front. We're setting up a Jenkins front end to run, uh, actually, one of the person doing that is here in the room, so you can pester him, and the guy with blonde hair down there, and there would be ways to, to monitor the whole kind of test run on top of Jenkins. Okay, we have time for two more questions and then we'll get to the trivia. One, one behind the um, Oh, sorry. I saw one person here and then we'll get to you okay. and that'll, that'll be it. Is that okay? Yep. All right. I'm actually glad for your last question because this my, no, the one on, on, on testing. As a upstream kind of guy, uh, one of the beats I've had for a very, very long time, it, uh, the testing is very good in terms of architecture, how it fits into distributions, uh, uh, and, and what, what you said is absolutely true in terms of uh, my, the quality of my code. Uh, the quality of my code is kind of better from, from the, the quality of the people who are packaging it. All of that is true. Uh, but the one place where I feel that uh, Daniel is a little bit weaker than other kinds of distribution mechanisms, all, all the software I write has tests in it. And when I go to Lintian or PopCon or any of that stuff, there's no evidence that I know of that any of those tests are written. And within Ruby, there's a, there's a Ruby kind of, there's several kinds of Ruby kind of testing kinds of things, or Python, there's several kinds of Python testing kinds of things, and AutoMake or AutoConf, there's even that, that testing. And there's no evidence that I know of that any of that's been written. So, so I, I totally hear you. I think you're right that you're actually quite weak on all that song. But some kind of technical details are important here. So for tests which can be built, which can be run at build time, so for tests that can be run at the end of the package build process, they are usually integrating the build process itself. So if the maintainer of your package in Debian has done the, in the right process, I don't doubt they've done so, at the end of which build of your package on all Debian architecture, the tests are run on that architecture. And if the test fails, the package will result as not built for the Debian uh, infrastructure. So you can look up the build logs of your package in Debian, okay. and at the end of the build log, you will see the outcome of the test that you have been producing as upstream. But that's only for the tests that can be run at build time, which are not all of them. So there are some sort of tests that you can run only you know, once you install the packages. So we have a technical a specification for that, which is called Auto Package PTG Test. <coughs> we are starting to have more and more Package in the archive, which are uh, which has been configured to, to, to use this sort of infra infrastructure, but we don't have yet. And that that's where you are totally right. Um, a periodic run of these tests for all packages in the archive, and I totally agree with you. And I think it's one of the direction where we should improve in the next twenty years. We have our last question back here. Uh, hello, uh, great presentation. Um, how common is it for the package maintainer and the developer to be the same person or committee? You mean uh, upstream developer and package maintainer? Or yes. Okay, uh, that happens. So it's uh, it requires. So the question is uh, how, how it goes when it happens, or? Yeah, I mean, I I'm just not sure how it works. Does that happen? So yes, it, it, it does happen. Uh, we have some Debian developers which are uh, quite popular upstream photos and they also maintain their own packages in, in Debian. The, the, point, the important technical point is to keep separate the two, the two roles. For instance, uh, we do not see something good as distributing the, uh, the Debian packaging part as part of your upstream tarball because maybe your upstream tarball will be used by others that don't like having that around or would like to do things differently. But we, Beside that, there is no real, no real issue. So, 
usually we have some good practice that we expect upstream authors to follow when for making it easier to integrate the software in Debian. And those same practices are followed even if the upstream author is Debian developed. So there is no real problem there. Just keeping in mind that there are two different roles and you should not mix them. Thank you. All right, so that was the questions. We have the, um, we have the trivia questions here. And uh, just a quick detail. These guys, they don't, they don't want to uh, oh, come I up. Oh, I need, you, you wrote the question, I need to ask them. Uh, you have the question, please? I have the question. Okay. Do you want to ask them instead, or do you want to ask them? No, 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 I can't do that. I'm kind of worried about what they wrote down. Okay. But so you want me to call it? So what, what if I don't know the answer? Find <laughs> the question in brackets. Don't read the part in parentheses. Uh, oh. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, 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 smart. Very smart. Okay. <laughs> So first question, <laughs> what's Ian Marduk middle initial? <laughs> uh, we got, okay, so we got to set some ground. Okay. I think you got it. Um, and yep. So take, take your pick of the book, one of the books or the uh, ebook voucher. But for everyone else, uh, raise your hand, don't shout it out. We've had some very sour faces coming <laughs> from not following those rules and we don't want anyone to leave unhappy. All right. Okay, so you should Check the answer, or no? I mean, if you if you uh, if you say that that's what they say and that's what I remember and that's what you remember and that's what everyone remembers. So, uh, how often, on average, did Debian release in the last ten years? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna yeah. Uh, did you finish? Yes. I'm gonna go over here. Here's your face. Two years. Good. All right. Book or voucher. The best is good for free books, more reliable. It depends on how much you want to carry home. These are heavy books. <laughs> so when was Wheezy frozen? <laughs> uh, the first, the first I saw was up here, so I'm going to go for that. Oh, uh, back there. June. June 2012 was that? Yeah. Not precise enough, I would say. I, okay, we need precision. Okay, okay. everyone, wait. five okay. seconds here. What's it? Get your precision down, What's and first person I see is uh, right here. Uh, sorry, I guess this I'm advantaging the people up front. I'll look back after this. April? I, I, no, okay. <laughs> <laughs> right. Let's try that again. So I'm going to go for someone in the back. Someone answered June, and we said not precise enough. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm going to go to the second half here. I'm doing so. You're right in the middle, so well, what's your answer? June 6th? June 6th. Nope. I'm going to go back here. June 12th. No. All right, you get a binary search going here. All right, yes, okay. June 30th, 2012. Take a vote, man. Oh, you're there. Okay. Excellent. A book on skeet XML. <laughs> 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 okay, thank you. All right. So the next one is uh, in which year did the social contact was written? Uh, go again. I'm sorry. Managing the front, but I saw you come up first. Nope. Nope. Oh, you're next. 97. Yep. Okay. Come back. Come back, Peter. Okay. All right. The back of the house. What is the name of the Debian release after Wheezy? <laughs> Okay, I have a hand over here. I have a hand. Please? No. After Wheezy, no. After Wheezy. Okay. I think it, I think it's the cameraman this time. <laughs> okay. Okay. We'll get it. We'll get it. All right. Jesse. Yeah. Yes. Take it. I, I feel. I feel a little bit like we should have rules about this. <laughs> 
So what attracted me to Debian and free software in general? <laughs> um, here we go. Control. Yep. <laughs> so last one is, what town and country is hosting this year's Debian conference? Oh. Town and country. <laughs> Are there, were you know, <laughs> what do we have on here? I forget how you pronounce it. It's, it's Switzerland, Austin, Cure, something like that? I, I didn't hear things. <laughs> Austin, Austin, Cure. He doesn't know how it's pronounced. So, try spelling it. Oh, sorry. sorry. Oh. All right. <laughs> yep. Can you, can you say that again? Bomaku. Yep, in the country. Switzerland. Yep. All right, that's, I believe, uh, that's the last one, I, think. I believe you're going to be forced to take a box on all the and all schemas. <laughs> well, I'm so happy to <laughs> 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 So thanks a lot. We'll be in the water tower and the workout from there, okay?